thank you so much for inviting me to, um, to speak in this um, exciting meeting and exciting session. And I'll just start by uh, a disclaimer about this company that I'm associated with. I'm not, I won't be talking about it, but I will say what I think you all know, <clears throat> which is that nobody dies of good health. Um, we die of, of disease. And this is, of course, just a partial list of the many diseases of aging. And what is striking about all these diseases is that they all pretty much follow the same trajectory. Very rare in young people, somewhere around the midpoint of our lifespan, they all begin to rise with approximately exponential kinetics. And of course, those of us who work on aging, we think this is not a coincidence. We think it's because there are some basic processes that um, drive aging and that it is those basic processes that then set us up to be susceptible to all of these very different diseases. So what I will tell you today is about one candidate basic process and uh, it's called cellular senescence. I'll explain that a little bit more uh, in detail, but we're pretty convinced now that at least in mice, we can say that this process drives a large number of age-related diseases, part of which are listed on this slide. So what is cellular senescence? Well, it's a state, it's a fate, actually a cell fate, into which cells enter usually as a consequence of either the kinds of stresses and damage that occurs during aging, or I'll show you in another couple of slides uh, in response to some physiological signals. <clears throat> so let's talk first about the stresses and the damage. Um, what I've listed here again is a partial list of the many types of things that change with age. And many of them put cells under stress and they cause cells to enter this state, which includes these three parts that are usually linked. And that is this irreversible arrest of cell proliferation. Um, the cells become somewhat resistant to death. And I'll show you it's not complete, but they do become somewhat resistant to cell death. And then of course, this very complicated a secretory phenotype, which we think is the major driver of what we recognize as an aging phenotype or disease. So anything that destabilizes the genome or the epigenome, um, of course, we're accumulating mutations throughout our life and especially oncogenic mutations will drive cells into this state. But even things that cause metabolic imbalances, for example, high glucose or the development of these um, <clears throat> advanced glycation end products or things that cause organelle stress like ER stress. So these are um, stress or damage signals that will drive cells into this state. But there is yet a different way of viewing this tripartite phenotype and that is that it is also a physiological response that has been under evolutionary pressure. So we know that the growth arrest is extremely important for suppressing the development of cancer. And this is known because we have uh, humans and mice that are defective in some of the genes that cause cells to arrest. And we know those animals and those people die in early death due to cancer. But in addition, there's now growing evidence that especially the secretory phenotype can help fine tune some of the um, structures that are important for embryonic development. There is a wave of senescence in the placenta prior to labor. And we now know that especially again, the secretory phenotype is important for tissue repair and homeostasis of certain tissues, including uh, wound healing. So the way we really prefer to think about senescence is that it is an evolutionary balancing act. It evolved for the good purposes of suppressing cancer, causing tissue remodeling, and um, uh, enabling embryogenesis and parturition. But the downside is, is that when senescent cells accumulate, which they do during age, um, especially again, the secretory phenotype <clears throat> can begin to drive um, those manifestations of aging, including very ironically, 
late life diseases that include cancer. So how do we know that uh, senescent cells accumulate with age? Well, we have a number of markers. Um, oops, sorry. I've listed some of them here. Um, many of these markers include what is outside the cell. So these damage associated molecular patterns are a characteristic of senescent cells. They secrete them. The first one was HMGB1, a protein that's normally in the nucleus. It leaves the nucleus and now is outside the cell where it signals, um, usually inflammation. And of course, this very complicated mixture of cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, proteases, and we now know even bioactive lipids. And in the cell, there are markers such as the stabilization of a transcription factor called GATA4, there's a loss of lamin B1, and of course the expression of these tumor suppressors and cell cycle inhibitors like P16 and P21. Unfortunately though, there are no senescent specific markers. This is simply uh, the biology. And so of course, when we look for the presence of senescent cells in tissues, um, we have to use multiple markers. So our lab and many labs have done this and we've been able to answer this question, when and where do senescent cells occur? So the first thing, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, they increase with age. This is true, <clears throat> excuse me, for virtually all um, mammalian uh, animals that have been looked at, actually all really vertebrate animals that have been examined and virtually all tissues, including the brain, which we typically think of as being post mitotic, but there are lots of non, there are lots of dividing cells in your brain and they do undergo senescence, the glial cells and, and the astrocytes. In addition, of course, we find them at higher levels in disease tissues compare, for example, to age-matched tissues. And again, um, this is an example of, of a brain from an uh, autopsy material from a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And again, it's the astrocytes that become senescent and show up with these senescent markers. But you find them at the base at, uh, of atherosclerotic plaques, for example, or senescent endothelial cells. There are senescent um, cells in arthritic joints, et cetera, et cetera. So in many ways, we can say that senescent cells are um, a candidate for driving multiple diseases and multiple phenotypes associated with aging. So what I'd like to do now is show you a, a little bit of, of data from uh, several labs, including ours, that focus uh, primarily on this multifaceted secretory phenotype, which is really what most of us have focused on because it is so complex and because it also lends itself to interventions, which of course is, is the big goal that most of us um, aim for when we study aging research. So as I said, the secretory phenotype we know is important for tissue remodeling and repair. It's also important for the role of senescent cells during embryogenesis. Um, but it is also, we believe, a major driver of those phenotypes and pathologies that we associate with aging. So uh, here is the model then. Um, at young ages, there are very few senescent cells and with age, senescent cells do accumulate. They're never a majority of cells within a tissue. And this will become important when we talk about eliminating them through a new class of drugs called senolytics. <laughs> um, these cells, of course, are secreting molecules that then can act on neighboring cells. And we know that these molecules that they secrete can cause neighboring cells to fail to function properly. And so this could drive some of the degenerative diseases associated with aging. <clears throat> and as I alluded to, of course, we are all accumulating premalignant cells with age due to mutations. And we believe that senescent cells can now change the tissue environment <clears throat> such that these premalignant cells can now be stimulated to go on to form um, the neoplastic um, phenotypes associated with aging. So this is a little depressing, right? If you don't have senescent cells, um, you're in trouble. And if you do have senescent cells, you're still in trouble. So of course, what the field has asked is, 
what can we do about this? Is there any interventions we can imagine that would prevent these processes from occurring or at least ameliorate the deleterious effects on the organism? So there are two strategies that a number of labs have imagined and including ours, the first one is simply, what if we can get the cells to stop secreting? <clears throat> and we've worked a lot on this. Um, I can tell you right now, we've abandoned this approach as an intervention. It's been very um, illustrative in helping us understand aging and understand senescent cells, but we think it may not be a very good way of trying to control the deleterious effects of senescent cells. And the reason is because we drill down like good cell and molecular biologists and identify the pathways that drive the secretory phenotype. So I've listed three of these important pathways here. One is the DNA damage response pathway. The other is um, this uh, pathway called the P38 MAP kinase NF kappa B pathway. And the third is the mTOR pathway. And the problem is, all of these pathways are really important for maintaining healthy tissues. You certainly do not want to interfere with the DNA damage response um, because that will then set the organism up for developing cancer. You certainly don't want to interfere with this um, MAP kinase NF kappa B pathway. This is absolutely essential for any kind of tissue repair or wound healing. And of course, our ability to respond to nutrients and growth factors depends critically on the mTOR pathway. So this is not a good strategy for preventing aging phenotypes and pathologies by interfering with these pathways. The other initially um, encouraging part of this um, arm of research is that big pharma and actually small pharma have developed many drugs that can interfere with each of these pathways. And the drugs work. We've tested a number of them and you can add the drug and the cells will slow down or sometimes even stop secreting some of the deleterious uh, molecules that senescent cells secrete. The problem is, as soon as you take the drug away, the cells start secreting again. So it requires constant pressure from a drug. And we think that this is not a very wise way to interfere with aging. Um, there really is no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. And so we thought we should think about a different way of eliminating the deleterious effects of senescent cells. And that is, what if we can overcome this resistance to apoptosis and cause the cells to die? And right now, this is a big thrust in the field of senescence, of finding ways to selectively kill off senescent cells. Remember, they're not a major part of any tissue, so we're not so worried about tissue atrophy, but more um, the goal is to get the cells to simply go away and that will then take care of their ability to secrete these deleterious molecules. So the two main approaches that have been used have been to develop um, transgenic mice, which we have done. Uh, there are actually two such mice. One is made by our colleagues, um, Jim Kirkland and Jan van Dersen at the Mayo Clinic and our mouse. They both rely on the same principle. And that is they take advantage of the fact that many, not all, but many senescent cells um, produce, uh, 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 express this tumor suppressor, P16. It's a cell cycle inhibitor. And so what we've done is we've caused the promoter for this gene to drive an artificial fusion protein. And the fusion protein allows us to visualize senescent cells by elucidase, uh, to sort senescent cells from tissues because of a red fluorescent protein. But most important, it contains a viral gene that has a very high affinity for this prodrug, gancyclovir. And what the, I didn't, Thymidine kinase does is it phosphorylates gancyclovir, which is a potent DNA chain terminator. Now, senescent cells don't undergo nuclear DNA synthesis because they're non-dividing, but of course their mitochondria are always 
um, the DNA is always turning over in the mitochondria. So this prodrug, when it's phosphorylated, goes into the mitochondria, fragments the mitochondrial genome, and the cells die by apoptosis. So as I said, there are two such transgenic mice that have been developed. And these mice now have given us a lot of confidence that at least in a mouse, senescent cells are driving a large number of DNA, of um, aging pathologies and diseases. Um, of course, the other approach, since we can't make transgenic people, is to develop drugs that will do what these transgenes will do. And this is this new class of drugs that I mentioned called senolytics. And um, a number of laboratories, as well as companies now, are develop this class of, developing this class of drugs. And the idea is that they would selectively kill senescent cells. It, it is interesting that a large number of these new uh, drugs, senolytics, are actually failed anti-cancer drugs. And the reason why they work as senolytics but not so well as anti-cancer drugs, is if you want to kill cancer cells, you have to kill every single one of them because if a cancer cell remains in the body, it has the potential to go on and form a secondary or even a metastatic tumor. Whereas in the case of what we've learned from the transgenic mice and the use of these drugs in the case of aging phenotypes, you don't need to kill every senescent cell. You just need to lower the burden uh, usually by somewhere between 70 and 80 percent, and that is usually sufficient to alleviate or at least ameliorate those large number of diseases that I showed on my first slide. So using these drugs and using the transgenic mouse models, I have here now, this is now a partial list because I really can't keep up with the literature anymore, of evidence that Eliminating senescent cells will alleviate a very, very large number of age-related diseases and pathologies. And so I've listed part of them here. Of course, they have to be used carefully because they will also interfere with wound healing, tissue regeneration, and of course, they would not be used, say, um, in, during pregnancy when the embryo is developing. But nonetheless, what these um, studies have shown us is that it is possible to intervene in a large swath of aging phenotypes by eliminating senescent cells. So as I mentioned, many of the diseases and the bad effects of senescence is caused by the secretory phenotype. And I want to tell you a little bit about what we've learned about the secretory phenotype. It's extremely complex. And for example, we now know that um, each cell type develops its own secretory phenotype. So what I'm showing you here is actually an old experiment that was done by Jean-Philippe Coppe when he was um, a student in my lab. What he did was he took fibroblasts and epithelial cells from the same tissue, from the same individual, so same genotype, just different cell types from the same tissue. And he compared fibroblasts with epithelial cells. And what you can see is there are things that are stromal specific, but there are also things that are epithelial specific. And we've now done this with many different types of human and mouse cells. And we can show that there are cell type specific differences in what the cells secrete, but there's overlap. There's also a great deal of overlap, and this is what we call the core um, secretory phenotype. And there's also species-specific differences. We work with mice, of course, but we really want to be able to cure human disease, and so it's important to understand the species-specific differences. The other thing we've learned about the secretory phenotype is that it's dynamic. It changes over time. Uh, I'm showing you a time course of human fibroblasts that have been induced to uh, senesce by ionizing radiation. And it's a time course of two genes. One is a gene that codes for a leukotriene, and it is pro-fibrotic. I just want to remind you that you need an initial fibrotic response in order to heal wounds. 
And the other is an antifibrotic prostaglandin. And you will see that the time courses are very different in the expression of these genes. We've, we actually was able to show that this is kind of important. We compared normal human fibroblasts with human fibroblasts from a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what you can see is that the pro-fibrotic gene is expressed to the same extent in both the wild type and the diseased um, fibroblasts, but the anti-fibrotic prostaglandin is delayed and actually it never reaches the levels that you see in wild type in those fibroblasts from the patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the other thing is that we do not know in vivo how cells become senescent, what drives them into senescence, but that inducer of senescence is really important in shaping the secretory phenotype. So I listed here are color-coded modules of the secretory phenotype that cause these phenotypes to differ from each other. And you can see that depending upon the inducer, the nature, <coughs> excuse me, of the secretory phenotype will vary. We actually have had much more um, uh, insight into the secretory phenotype by looking at proteins. So RNA is good, but it doesn't always translate into proteins. Um, this is a collaboration with uh, Birgit Schilling, who is a mass spec guru at the Buck Institute. And looking at different inducers, and these are human fibroblasts looking at both the soluble proteins and proteins that are in exosomes, we've been able to come up with a core of proteins that basically are shared depending upon the inducer. And what is gratifying about this is this is a paper from Luigi Ferrucci's lab in which he looked in people at proteins present in the plasma that could act as aging biomarkers. <clears throat> and there's a large number of proteins that overlap between what senescent cells produce and these aging biomarkers. So what we have learned is that senescent cells can be good. And when they're good, they tend to be transiently present. They are cleared by the immune system. And under those conditions, um, we have optimal embryogenesis, optimal tissue repair, and homeostasis. But when they persist, which is what happens during aging, now they become deleterious. And we know that under those conditions, they really become maladaptive and they begin to drive those phenotypes and pathologies that we associate with aging. So as I mentioned, um, nobody wants to try to make transgenic people. So of course, what we're all interested in are these drugs, these new senolytic drugs. And from what we've learned from the mouse and also from human tissues and cells in culture, they do hold a lot of promise for extending what has now been termed health span. That is promoting the health <clears throat> of um, multiple tissues that have been examined. Of course, what everyone also wants to know is what about lifespan? You know, are we gonna be able to live for 500 years if we all take our dose of senolytics every few months? And the answer is probably not. That experiment has actually been done in mice <clears throat> by uh, the Van Dersen lab. And what they were able to show is that although there is an impressive increase in median lifespan of the mouse, if you cons uh, consistently eliminate senescent cells at various points throughout life, um, maximum lifespan really did not change. And, and the question is, is why? The short answer is we don't know. I'll just um, propose to you some ways of thinking about this problem. So many of you are familiar with C. elegans. We know that this has been a fantastic model organism for studying aging. And I think the world record for extending the lifespan of this little worm uh, is tenfold. However, if you now go to a more complex organism, for example, Drosophila, the fruit fly, um, the world record is less than twofold. And if you really look carefully at um, the data in mice, um, 
lifespan extension rarely exceeds maybe 25%, and even that is, is somewhat um, questionable. So it is possible that as evolution evolved more and more complex animals, including humans, that the setting of maximum species-specific lifespan is under the control of so many different genes, it may not be possible to find a single intervention that will budge this maximum lifespan. And so I think for the moment, there is great hope for extending health span. Uh, lifespan, we still have a lot to learn before we can have any confidence that this can be budged. And so I will just end here. And first of all, thank all of the people in my lab who have contributed to this work, but also a large number of past lab members and collaborators um, that have contributed to our understanding of aging and how senescent cells might impact aging. So thank you.